<clears throat> Let's wait a couple of minutes as we always do. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah wa alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. So welcome all of you <coughs> back to our weekly uh, lecture. Um, uh, inshallah tonight we have an interesting topic. And it's a topic dealing with uh, issues related to the manners of a Muslim. The adab or the akhlaq of a Muslim. Uh, of course, we are these lectures that we give, alhamdulillah, we try to cover various uh, branches of Islam from aqidah to tafsir to hadith to fiqh. And of course, an aspect of Islam that many of us uh, tend to fall short in or even worst case, uh, we fail in are the manners of Islam. That a lot of us may have <coughs> the correct aqidah or so we say, but then our behavior is the absolute opposite of what the aqidah demands. Or a lot of us might have good manners, but their aqidah is batil, or very faulty. So, of course, Islam, when we say that we have to follow the Prophet wasallam, we have to follow the companions, radiallahu anhu majma'in, <coughs> we mean that one has to follow the footsteps of the Prophet ﷺ when it comes to the aqidah, meaning the creed, the belief, the core fundamentals of Islam, your belief structure, also the actions, the way you practice your religion, and of course the manners, the akhlaq, the, the adab, the mannerisms of the Prophet ﷺ. So our goal as Muslims living in this generation should be, has to be, that we want to follow the righteous predecessors in all these three branches of Islam, from the creed to the actions and to the behavior. So, inshallah ta'ala, tonight's topic, as you've know, as you already know, brothers and sisters from my community, 
uh, you got the text message as well as uh, you've seen the post on the Facebook, is about our treatment towards those with disabilities, the people who are disabled, whether they have disability of the mind or disability of the body, because disabilities are of two kinds. Some people have disability with their mind, others have a disability with their body. And of course, you look at the past one year, subhanAllah, by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the entire world is going through or experiencing a pandemic, right? This COVID-19 uh, coronavirus. And a lot of the people, subhanAllah, they realize the, the blessing of having good health. And of course, sad reality is, even with all these troubles, there will be <clears throat> people all the time who won't understand anything. They won't understand the ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they will not change any way whatsoever. And of course, we seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from being blinded by the dunya in that, to that level. Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, he said in a hadith that's collected in Sahih al-Bukhari, in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ni'matani maghboonun fihima kathirun min nas There are two blessings that most of mankind, or many people, are deceived by. They don't really pause and think about these two blessings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As-sihhatu wal-faragh. Good health and free time. These are the two biggest blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that most people or a lot of people fail to actually ponder over. Many times people are complaining left and right. Every little, every other sentence that comes out of their mouth is a complaint about something. But they have two functioning eyes, their mind is functioning, their ears are working, their limbs are working, everything is functioning properly and alhamdulillah generally speaking their body is healthy you shouldn't be complaining or people have free time they don't utilize that free time they don't utilize that time to learn their religion to correct their mistakes to repent for their sins like you should utilize free time in in wise ways that's the successful believer who is able to take advantage of their good health and the free time that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses them with. And this is, generally speaking, Allah Azza wa Jal, He tells us in the Quran, <clears throat> وَإِن تَعُدُّوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْسُوهَا If you were to attempt to count the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the favors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon you, لَا تُحْسُوهَا You would not be able to count them. You'll run out of numbers. But you'll see that the favors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon you are more. Inna Allaha insana la zalumun kafar. Indeed, mankind, generally speaking, is most unjust and ungrateful. So they're unjust. La zalumun kafar. They do zulm on themselves and against each other. And kafar, they are ungrateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's as if Allah has not blessed them with anything, the way people complain. Every little thing is a complaint. And of course, we seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from being people like that. It's like the people whose hearts have been sealed, their eyes have been sealed, their ears have been sealed, even though we see them able to see and hear, but the, the eyes and ears of iman are closed. They just don't understand anything. Now in respect of this topic of dealing with the disabled, <clears throat> you, we should always remember, first of all, that just because somebody is disabled, or somebody has disabled children, does not mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is punishing that person. And there's a reason why I'm bringing this as the first point. Because culturally speaking, and I'm sure you as the viewers, listeners, you know this better than me. Because I'm, you know, culturally speaking, I'm a corrupt person. Born in Europe, raised in America. So culturally speaking, I'm, I'm all over the place, right? <laughs> but cult, I mean, there are Muslim countries or most of the Muslim areas, whether they be Arabs, the Indo-Pak subcontinent, 
African Muslims. We, this is a huge problem in the Ummah today. Many people, many Muslims, subhanAllah, even though we should not be the ones to think this way. And inshallah, after tonight's lecture, reminder, hopefully you will realize that there is no way we should be thinking this way. And it's actually haram for us to think this way. But culturally speaking, many times, and I, I know this because I deal with people, families of different racial backgrounds and different uh, socioeconomic backgrounds, and they tell me their problems. A lot of times somebody may be disabled, or somebody may, by the qadr of Allah, a woman may give birth to a son or daughter who is disabled, whether with a mental disability or physical disability. And they become the talk of the block, or the talk of the village, or the talk of the town, or their community. And other people start saying, oh, that couple is being punished by Allah. Don't you see they have a crippled daughter, or crippled son, or uh, this or that? This is how people think. And it, and it really is a shame that Muslims would think this way. Or I have seen, subhanAllah, with my own eyes, you know, when I was young and even in my adult life, uh, I wish I could stop seeing these things, but it happens. A lot of times in Muslim communities, maybe a child comes to the masjid, child comes into some public gathering, and he or she clearly has some type of disability, whether it be a physical disability or a disability of the mind. And the other people are looking at the parents and the child, with, they're frowning as if, why did you bring this thing outside? Like, you know, you should keep her or him locked up in your house. Don't bring them to the gathering. They're a nuisance, they're a disturbance, and this and that. People react this way. Wallahi, this is, it really is something that is haram, and it is sickening for Muslims, someone who claims to be a Muslim, someone who says, La ilaha illallah, to say these type of things or to react in this manner against other fellow Muslim brothers and sisters who may be tested with their bodies or their minds. So this is something, brothers and sisters, you have to understand no matter what, that mentality that comes from your pagan cultures, whatever respective cultures you come from, that has to be thrown out and dumped into the trash. As a Muslim, no way are you allowed to think this way. That just because somebody is disabled or somebody has a disabled child, Allah is punishing them and we should frown upon them and stay away from them as if they have, they're some, uh, they, they have a plague, as if they're contagious or something like that. Right? So that's something please remember throughout the lecture and we shall see from the behavior of the Prophet ﷺ. Now of course we're saying that this is how is the Islamic treatment towards the disabled people. Whenever we talk about any type of treatment, any type of behavior, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us in the Quran regarding Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ And we have not sent you except as a mercy to all that exists. So if you want to learn rahmah, how to have rahmah towards other human beings, how to have rahmah towards the other creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, be they Muslim or kuffar, be they old or young, be they men or women. If you want to learn how to have mercy and how to have kindness towards other people and other creatures, then you look at the Prophet wasallam. He was sent as a mercy to all that exists. He is or was the Prophet of mercy. Nabiyur Rahmah. And also as Muslims, people will especially in this day and age where people keep running to this person and that person or this famous psychiatrist says, Dr. Phil says, and Oprah Winfrey says, this is what you should do and this is what you should not do in, in your family. I don't care what these Christians, Jews, atheists, Hindus, Buddhists, whatever they may be, what they're saying and how to deal with people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ Indeed, there is in the Messenger of Allah for you, the greatest example, the best example. I don't need somebody, Mr. Goldberg or John Smith, telling me what is right and what is wrong, how I should deal with this person and how I should not deal with that person. When Allah Azza wa Jal has told me, as a believer, 
someone who said ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna muhammadar rasulullah that that messenger of allah he is the best example for you no human being can give you better advice in how to live life no human being can be a better example for you better role model for you than muhammad ibn abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam liman kana yarju allah wal yawm al akhira wa dhakara allah kathira for the one who hopes to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and believes in the last day and hopes to meet Allah on the last day and he remembers Allah a lot. For that type of person, guess what? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the best example. Those who don't remember Allah much, those who don't look forward to meeting Allah on the day of judgment, those who don't believe in the day of judgment, of course they will not take Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam as an example as the best example so as a muslim always always remember if you want to learn how to be a good husband go see what the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam did with his wives you want to learn how to be a good father see what he did with his kids you want to learn how to be a good neighbor see him you want to know how to be a leader for the muslims see him, look at him so every aspect of life who is your role model or who should be your role model as a muslim man or woman muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and this is a command from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so throughout this topic and any other such topic when it comes to behavior attitude lifestyle living uh, always remember we said wa ashhadu anna muhammadar rasulullah this is the second aspect of the testimony of faith and i bear witness that there that Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is the final prophet and messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you bore witness to this fact so you should follow his behavior you should follow his characteristics and take him as your number one role model so let's see what the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam or how he used to behave with those who were disabled around him and that will clearly tell us as muslims how we are obligated to deal with those who have disabilities whether it be disabilities of the mind or disabilities of the body and inshallah ta'ala I'll, I'll i'll bring a few ahadith because of course again in our lecture our our 15 minutes we can't bring hundreds of ahadith but we're going to talk about a few ahadith that gives a different you know the whole uh, overall idea whether it be someone who's disabled in the mind or someone who is disabled in the body Let's see how the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam dealt with them whether they be male or female and how the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam told us to deal with them. First of all, the hadith that I want to bring is a hadith that's collected in Sahih al-Bukhari. Anas radiyallahu anhu Anas ibn Malik, he's the one who narrated this hadith. He said that the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Inna Allah qal." So سَمِعْتُ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ قَالْ That inna اللَّهَ قَالْ That I heard the messenger say that Allah said. So this is a hadith Qudsi. إِذَا ابْتَلَيْتُ عَبْدِي بِحَبِيبَتَيْهِ فَصَبَرَ عَوَّدْتُهُ مِنْهُمَ الْجَنَّةِ The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said that Allah said, If I deprive my slave of his two beloved possessions and he remains patient i will let him enter paradise in compensation for them ibn hajar rahimahullah who is the one who has the famous monumentous monumental work fathul bari which is the sharh of sahih al bukhari the explanation of sahih al bukhari in the explanation of this hadith ibn hajar rahimahullah he mentioned that the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says here that idha abtalaytu abdi bi habibatayhi that when i test my when i give a, a, a severe test to my slave and i take away his two beloved possessions in this hadith the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is talking about eyesight we have two eyes only human beings have two eyes right the two beloved possessions why did the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam use this word habibatayhi his two beloved uh, possessions 
Yet this is because they are the most two beloved parts of the body to a human being. To any human being. You ask anyone that, what is, that he wants to see, she wants to be able to see. Right? That somebody might have missing limbs, somebody may have something, but he'll still or she will still say, Alhamdulillah, I can see. I'm able to see. Right? Like, we, like imagine. Like imagine if you were to blindfold yourself and walk around your house for one day. Like, I mean, can you imagine? You would feel like your whole world has been ripped apart. I can't see anything. I can't see my family. I can't see my children. I'll only hear their voice. I mean, this is a severe, severe test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a physical disability, blindness. This is what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is talking about. So the reason why they are so beloved is that when they are lost, an individual experiences sorrow at the fact that they cannot see anything around them. And they wish to see, they wish to take delight in that, and they cannot see their loved ones. They cannot see the beautiful things that they were once able to see. Or someone who is born blind. They have literally no clue what this world looks like, what their mother looks like, what their father looks like, what their siblings look like. This is a severe test. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says here in this hadith Qudsi, or the Prophet وسلم, said that Allah said, that when I take away the two beloved possessions of my slave, so right then and there, brothers and sisters, we have to understand, did Allah say here that He has punished this disabled guy or woman? No. It is Allah who is Al-Hakim, the Most Wise, who is Al-Alim, the All-Knowing. It's His decision what He chooses to give or not give to His creation. We don't have that choice. It is His decision alone, which one of His creation shall suffer what thing at what time and to at what extent. We don't control any of this. This whole dunya life is a trial for us. Based on how we deal with it, whether we are patient or impatient, whether we turn to Allah or turn away from Him, that is what the reward in the akhirah, the eternal life is for. So Allah says here, those from whom I take away their two beloved things. And this is the hadith that yes, they are beloved possessions. You should love the body that Allah has given you. You should love your hands, you should love your face, you should love your legs, you should love your body. Allah has blessed you with this body. Take care of it, be good to it, be kind to it. And this is another hadith from Sahih al-Bukhari that your body has rights over you. Allah gave it to you. Don't Eat things that are haram and destroy it. Don't live away in a way that you destroy your body. You're being ungrateful to the ni'mah that Allah gave. So take care of your health, take care of your body in the best way that you are able to do so. So the Prophet ﷺ says that these are prized possessions, beloved possessions. And if Allah takes it away, فَصَبَرَ And that person has sabr. أَوَّدْتُهُ مِنْهُمَ الْجَنَّةِ As a compensation. For that trial in this dunya, I will give him in exchange for that suffering of this temporary life, I will exchange it with permanent, eternal bliss in paradise. So those of us who are disabled, those of your children or siblings or neighbors or community members that you know, share this hadith with them. That listen, brother, sister, we don't know why Allah is testing you with this, but it is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some people get tested with loss of life. They lose somebody in their family. A beloved one dies. Somebody loses their job, they end up in the street. Allah is testing you with the loss of some type of uh, physical strength, or uh, you know, Allah is testing you with some disability. Be patient. And Allah will exchange it for you, this temporary life. How long are you going to live in this dunya? But the eternal life, Jannah is guaranteed for you, inshallah ta'ala. Provided you remain a good, decent Muslim, and be patient with the trial that Allah gave. So this is for those who are suffering. Allah has not forgotten you. Sometimes some people, they're suffering, they're disabled, and they start thinking, it's a waswasa from shaitan. Doesn't Allah love me? Why am I like this? Why can't I walk straight like everybody else? Why can't I sit? 
properly? Why do I have hip problems? Well, oh, maybe Allah doesn't love me. Those are all from shaitan. Never, ever think like this about your Lord. Rather, remain positive. It's, it, it's, it's hard work. That's why the reward is so great. It's not easy. The reward is so great. That be patient with this trial, Allah will guarantee paradise for you. And just because somebody is blind, or somebody has other disability of one kind, it doesn't mean that Allah deprives him of everything. Brothers and sisters, think, think, how many Qurra, Qur'an reciters do you know in your life that you have seen with your own eyes? A young man is blind, but he's leading the salah. A sheikh, an alim, he is blind. I'll give an example. Sheikh bin Baz, rahimahullah, one of the top scholars of, this, of our generation, the past century. Right? One of the top three or four scholars in the whole world. He was blind. But is anybody gonna, even those with eyesight, me and you, we're not even equal to a toe of Sheikh bin Baz, rahimahullah. And he's not the only one in Islamic history. There have been many, many hadith scholars, Qur'an scholars, fiqh scholars, ulama, giants of Islam, who have been blind. Allah took away something, but Allah gave them other things that excelled, that they excelled with far, far more than other human beings. Like sometimes we might look at people, they are sad. My son, my daughter is autistic, or some other type of issue. How many children, subhanAllah, have you known that somebody may be autistic, but subhanAllah, this young man, young woman, is so intelligent in something else. Maybe one or two things in their daily life they are falling short in due to their autism. But they are so smart. I've seen, subhanAllah, some autistic boys, they were geniuses when it came to math. And you would think, okay, like this is what somebody who's ignorant like would automatically assume. Oh, somebody has you know, got autism, so this is a defect in the mind, must be dumb. People talk this way, subhanAllah, and that's why I kept saying that get, put those cultural mentality in the trash. As a Muslim, you cannot think this way about people who have disabilities. They're smarter than us in many aspects. I've seen, subhanAllah, this one young brother, I remember at, when I met him, he was 11 years old, really, really severe autism. But his, I mean, the way he draws things, like, of course, he had to be taught that don't draw people and animals. It's haram for us as Muslims. But he got that part. Subhanallah, you, you would think that this was drawn by some, I don't know, those paintings that sell for hundreds of thousands of dollars, like, like super duper nice. And this is what he's capable of doing. Many people, us, I, I mean, I, I got functioning eyes and brain, and the, I, I have no idea how to draw anything close to that, right? So many of us are like that, that we might have functioning uh, means, and our body is functioning properly, but we don't have some of the skills that subhanAllah these brothers and sisters who have some type of disability have, because that is the justice of Allah. Allah took away something, one thing or two things. But He did not take away everything from that person. So the Muslim, the believer has to remember this. Those who are suffering and those who are around those who have these disabilities. It's not the end of the world. Be patient for this one or two things that Allah has te is testing you with, that Allah has taken you away from, uh, taken from you. But Allah has blessed you with other things. You have to think about it. Search, I mean, on YouTube, you will find, subhanAllah, I think uh, there's this African brother, I forgot which country he's from, but he's from Africa. He doesn't understand anything. People have to change his clothes for him. If you listen to his recitation, you will be in tears. Perfect tajweed, beautiful voice, and he is able to memorize the whole Qur'an. How did this happen? That someone who needs help, his brain is not functioning to the point that he has to change his own clothes. He doesn't know when he's wetting his himself or defecating. Other people have to change him. But this person, by the rahmah of Allah, has memorized his kalam, and he sounds so beautiful. Allah blessed him with things that Allah did not give the other person. So you, as a Muslim, you must always look at the bigger picture. Look at somebody from all different angles. Just because you see somebody maybe crippled, walking this, that, 
don't just start judging a book by its cover. This is not the way a Muslim is supposed to be. And don't start judging the families that have children with disabilities. That they are being tested. If these parents do a good job, and inshallah they do, in taking care of their son or daughter who has a disability, this is a ticket to go to Jannah for these parents. It's right in, in, in their laps. If these, this father and mother are able to take good care of this disabled child, they do it perfectly inshallah ta'ala, and they uphold their Islam, Jannah is guaranteed for these parents. So this is a huge, huge blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So as a believer, you should always look at the bigger picture. Don't be deceived by shaitan into just looking at what is negative and you forget the other 20 positive things that surround it. Salman al-Farasi radiallahu anhu, when he visited the sick, and this is collected in Imam Bukhari's Adab al-Mufrad, and it's a sahih hadith. When he visited the sick, he would say, Abshir, good news for you. I mean, can you, I mean, when we go to the sick, we're like miserable, that person's miserable. This is a Sahabi, and he's one of the giants among the companions. We all know who Salman al-Farsi was, right? He would go and say, Abshir, good news, glad tidings for you. فَإِنَّ مَرَضَ الْمُؤْمِنِ يَجْعَلُهُ اللَّهُ لَهُ كَفَارَةً وَمُسْتَعْتَبًا Good news. Indeed, Allah makes the illness of a believer an expiation for him and a restoration. When a mu'min suffers any type of illness slash disability, that is an opportunity for the believer to be forgiven by Allah, to have his status raised in the akhirah, and as the restoration of his iman. This is good news. However, Salman radiallahu anhu, he said, وَإِنَّ مَرَضَ الْفَاجِرِ But as for the fajr, the one who disobeys Allah left and right, he doesn't care what's halal, what's haram, he's angry with Allah all, all day, all night, he doesn't want to follow the sunnah, a fajr, a criminal, right? He disobeys Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For that person, when he suffers an illness, when he gets sick, it's kalba'ir. It's like a camel, alaqahu, aqalahu, He's like a camel who was shackled by his people and then he was let go. And the camel has no clue as to why he was shackled in the first place and why they let him go. An animal. You're just like a camel. You have no idea why people tied you up and why people let you go. That's the fajr who goes through illnesses and sicknesses. But the mu'min... He understands that this is an opportunity for me to attain Jannah. This is an opportunity for me to have my sins and my shortcomings forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So remember this, whenever you're suffering any type of disability, any type of sickness, any type of illness, this is an opportunity for you to have your status raised in a life that is permanent. This dunya life is temporary. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in that hadith, the initial hadith that I mentioned, the hadith Qudsi, عَوَّدْتُهُ مِنْهُمَ الْجَنَّةِ I will compensate for him for taking away those two beloved possessions. Of course, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa gave here the example of blindness, but this is, you know, your patient with any type of disability. That Allah will exchange it, compensate the person with paradise. This shows that this is the best compensation possible. Sometimes people get into a car accident, they become paralyzed, they file a lawsuit, get $5 million. What is that $5 million going to do for someone who has become completely paralyzed? Even if he buys a Ferrari, he won't be able to drive it. Even if he buys a million dollar home, he's still going to be stuck on his bed. Dunya compensation does not mean anything, brothers and sisters. The compensation that comes in the akhirah, that is the greatest, the best number one compensation that anyone can ever dream of. So Allah tests people with disabilities and compensates for that with Jannah, inshaAllah ta'ala. Jabir ibn Abdullah radiallahu anhu, he said in another hadith that's collected in a tirmidhi on the day of judgment, when the people who had uh, ibtila, they had severe trials, whether it be sicknesses, illnesses, disabilities, other severe calamities that they went through, they are brought on the day of judgment when we're all being judged. And they see the thawab. And everybody sees the thawab, the reward that these people will receive. 
لو أن جلودهم كانت قرضت في الدنيا بالمقاريب. So the other people who are seeing the re amount of reward that these people are receiving for those who had these disabilities and these severe calamities in the dunya, those who did not have any calamity, they will wish on the day of judgment. They will wish that their skins were cut with scissors in the dunya. That this guy had a physical disability, look at the thawab, look at the amount of reward Allah is giving to him on this day. I wish I had my skin being ripped off with scissors. That's what the people will do on Yom Al Qiyamah. Those who did not have disabilities, those who did not have these bodily calamities. Subhanallah. So what does this tell you, brothers and sisters? That this is not something that they are lacking. Do not think those who are disabled are behind. They could be most likely far, far ahead of us on Yom Al Qiyamah. So never ever undermine those who have any type of disability. All right. So now let's go to the next section. Let's directly talk about certain issues, the, how the Prophet ﷺ would treat them. The Prophet ﷺ, he used to try and raise their morale. Anyone who had some type of disability, some type of shortcoming in their body, he would always try to do his best to motivate them. Don't make them feel worse. Raise their motivation. That, was from, that is from the sunnah, and that's something that we have to do. Because he would clarify to the people that people do not compete for superiority based on their physical appearance. Allah does not care about your physical appearance. He's the one who gives the strength and the weakness to different peoples. Allah cares about your iman. Allah looks at your heart, and Allah looks at your deeds. Allah looks at your words, your actions, and your intentions. He doesn't care if you're crippled, or you're, you know, running around like Usain Bolt. Doesn't matter. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who gives different people different things. A hadith that's collected in the Musnad of Ahmed, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. And Abdullah ibn Mas'ud was one of the scholars of the Quran among the Sahaba, right? Radiallahu anhu. He was physically deformed from waist down. A lot of people don't know this. In fact, he wasn't just physically deformed waist down. He, what, I mean, we, I wouldn't say he was a dwarf, but basically what the description of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud is, when he would be standing, it would look like as if it's somebody who's sitting. Because then when somebody's on their knees, like let's say people around him were on their knees sitting, and he's standing, then he'd be the same height as everybody else. So that's how short Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, one of the ulama of the Sahaba, one of the greatest companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, one of those big companions that has given to us the meaning of the Quran, because he was a mufassir. So Abdullah ibn Mas'ud was physically deformed like this. Once he was climbing up a tree to, you know, get the branches for to make the miswak, the toothbrush. The wind came, blew his thobe, and his really skinny, deformed legs unnaturally skinny legs. So you can imagine, he's very short, super skinny legs. This is a deformity, this is a disability. So he's climbing up the tree, the wind blew his thobe and his legs got exposed. And those who were on the ground, they started laughing. You know how people, oh, chicken legs, chicken legs. This is what you know people say nowadays, right? If somebody does have that. But th these are things that you should not do as a Muslim. The Prophet ﷺ looked at these companions and said, what are you laughing at? And they said, look at his legs. The Prophet ﷺ got so upset and angry. He corrected them. They made a mistake. Right? They're learning Islam. They're learning the manners of Islam. He frowned at these companions. And he said, Wallahi, I swear by Allah. In the other narration, Walladi nafsu biyadi. I swear by the one in whose hand is my soul. Each leg on Yawm al Qiyamah will weigh the weight of Mount Uhud. Each leg will weigh the weight of Mount Uhud on the Mizan. Where are you? You're laughing at his deformed legs? Look how weighty those legs will be on the Day of Judgment. Subhanallah. What do you think happened to Abdullah ibn Mas'ud when he heard the Prophet ﷺ say this about his deformed physique? Don't you think it boosted his uh, morale? 
Don't you think it made him happy when the other people were making fun of him? Of course it did. And look what he became, subhanAllah. So this is what the Prophet ﷺ would do with the people who had these physical disabilities, clearly visible physical disabilities. Look at the other Sahabi, Julaybib radiallahu anhu. Like he was short, he had a, uh, like really deformed, nobody even wanted to take a second look at him, let alone marry him. Right, nobody, but he loved him so much. Julaybib radiallahu anhu, the Prophet ﷺ loved him. And he sent to, to uh, one of the homes that go to that house and ask for a marriage. And Julaybi was confused. Who's going to marry me? Look at me. I'm physically deformed. I'm this, I'm that. I'm ugly as the people say. Nobody even wants to take a second look at me because of my deformities. So he went. And the father of the woman obviously knows who this is. And he said, Allah's Messenger has sent me to ask you for your daughter's handed marriage. So the father, of course, I mean, would anyone, if a deformed guy came for your daughter, you're going to think 30 times before you say, even let him or even have a discussion about marriage. So the father is like, no. The woman, she heard Julaybib at the door and she heard what he said. And she told her father, if Rasulullah sent this man for me, he is the best man, I accept. Allah's Messenger is not going to decide something stupid. He specifically chose him to come to me and ask for marriage. I'll marry him. And what happened? Julaybib died in one of the battles, the very first battle that he went to after marriage. He died as a shaheed. And the Prophet ﷺ said he is in Jannah. So you can't judge a book by its cover. So the Prophet ﷺ would raise the morale, he would motivate these people that you have some type of disability, don't feel sad. He would tell them on their face that Allah has chosen you for such and such thing. Allah will grant you more. Allah will give you more. Don't lose hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the way we have to be. When you see a disabled brother, when you see a disabled sister, you have to remind that person, Ya akhi, ya ukhti, have patience. Allah has blessed you. Perhaps you're not looking at it, but He has blessed you in ways that He did not bless me. You can go to a higher level of Jannah than even me. You have to motivate them. This is from the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Don't make them look or feel even sad that somebody's on a wheelchair. Hey, you want to go run a run a race? What are you What are you What are you saying to this person? Don't make, Don't people do that? Subhanallah. I don't know. Maybe some of you are laughing. Like, what is? People are so inconsiderate that they don't see the person has a disability and they'll rub it on their face. Oh, I'm sorry, you can't play basketball with us, you're in a wheelchair. I've heard such things with my own two ears. Like SubhanAllah, what is wrong with human beings that you want to rub it on somebody's face like this? So that is the absolute opposite of what the Prophet ﷺ used to do. Also the Prophet ﷺ would visit those who are disabled and he would honor their requests. In another hadith that's collected in Bukhari and Muslim, the Prophet ﷺ, he went to the house of Mahmud ibn Rabi'ah. He was one of the Ansari, radiallahu anhu. Uh, and also Itban ibn Malik, radiallahu anhu, and he had witnessed the Battle of Badr. So he said, they said that uh, a, a man, and he said, uh, Mahmud said that I'm a man who has weak vision. You know, I, would you come to my house, pray? I have weak vision, I can't always come to the masjid, pray with you. I would like for you to come to my house and pray. So the Prophet ﷺ said, if Allah wills, we'll do that. The Prophet ﷺ, he didn't just go alone. He took Abu Bakr, his best friend. So they went, and of course, the most knowledgeable Muslim and the one with the most iman after Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam from the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, right? So the two of them went to this person's house, and the first thing they gave the salam, and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam asked, "Where do you want me to offer salah? You told me to come visit and pray in your house, and you want to designate that spot as your personal musalla in your house, which is from the Sunnah, that." you should have a specific designated area. Even if you live in a one-bedroom apartment, don't worry about it. 
one specific area should be designated that whenever you pray in your house, especially the women, this is your specific spot. This is from the sunnah of Rasulullah that you have a musalla, a prayer area in your own house. So he asked, he honored this request of this disabled companion, that I will come to your house. Now you tell me, where do you want me to pray so you can designate that as your personal musalla? So he showed. The Prophet ﷺ prayed, led them in the salah, made the taslim, and he was about to leave. But then, of course, they stopped him and said, let's eat. Let's, you came, let's eat a meal together. And the Prophet ﷺ ate. They talked, they visited. So what does this show you? That he ﷺ would, from time to time, would go visit those who were disabled in the community. And he would sit with them, and he would eat with them, have a conversation with them, make them feel good. Keep them engaged in your life. They shouldn't be stuck in a room or a house by themselves, feeling more depressed than what they probably already feel like. You should have interaction with them. You should visit those who are disabled in your community. The Prophet wasallam he took care of their needs. Anas radiallahu anhu, he narrates to us a hadith that's collected in Sahih Muslim. That, anna imra'atan kana fi aqliha shay' A woman came who had a mental disability. There was something in her mind. There was something wrong with her mind. Look at the word that Anas radiallahu anhu says here. That kana fi aqliha shay. She had something wrong with her intellect. Some crazy woman just showed up. This is not the way he described her. They were polite people. Subhanallah. They gave them respect. Yes, she has something wrong with the mind, but Anas didn't just say a majnuna, some mad crazy woman. No, something is wrong with her aql. She has intellectually, she's a little bit deficient. فقالت, so she came to the Prophet ﷺ, and everybody knew her that she doesn't really know what she's saying. She's defective, has a disability in the mind. So this woman comes, she's always talking, nobody really pays much attention, and she keeps on talking about different things. Sometimes doesn't make sense. So she said, Ya Rasulullah, O Allah's Messenger, Inna li ilayka haja. Indeed, I have some need from you. فَقَالَ So the Prophet ﷺ heard this from the woman. And he replied, يَا أُمَّ فُلَانَ O oh, the mother of so-and-so, إِنْ ذُرِي أَيَّ سِكَكِ شِئْتِ حَتَّى أَقْضِيَ لَكِ حَاجَتَكِ See which side of the road you would like to stand. I'll be there. And you talk. You talk your heart out. Tell me what it is that you need. How can I be of service? How can I be of help? فَخَلَى مَعَهَا فِي بَعْضِ الطُّرُقِ حَتَّى فَرَغَتْ مِنْ حَاجَتِهَا So the Prophet ﷺ, Anas and the other companion saw him. He stood on the side of, with her on the roadside, until she, and they were alone. Everybody could see them, but they could not hear the conversation, because the Prophet ﷺ gave her that respect. That sh something is wrong with her mind. She might be, as we would like to say, just yapping nonsense. But he وسلم, gave her the time. Everybody saw him that he is standing just with her on the side of the road because it has to be a public space. Men and women who are not related, they don't sit together in a closed room by themselves. That's haram in our religion. So he was in a public spot on the side of the street. Everybody saw the two of them. But they could not hear them because he وسلم, gave her the respect of privacy. And, she, and he stood there until she was fully satisfied. And she had her complaints and seeking advice and whatever other problems she may have for hours. This is the way the Prophet ﷺ treated even those who had disability of the mind, who may not always be taught making sense in what they're saying. But he gave them time, subhanAllah. He respected their privacy. And Imam al nawi in the Sharh of Sahih Muslim, he explained with this hadith, that Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he stood with her on the pathway that is occupied and used. And the people witnessed both of them. Yet they could not hear their conversation because he wanted to respect the privacy. Her questioning, uh, she, he did not want others to hear what she was saying. This is how much care he took in taking care of the needs of those who are even disabled in their mind. This shows, subhanAllah, the forbearance the humbleness, the, the patience, and the love and rahmah that he وسلم, had for those who were disabled. What happened, subhanAllah, and here I'm going to tell you something 
that I've seen in many communities, including ours. In my three years that I've been here so far, I've noticed that there's quite a few young brothers, I don't know about the sister section, uh, but I heard from my wife, there's also a couple of sisters she came across who have some form of maybe severe autism or you know, a, autism of lesser or higher degree. And I've seen brothers, they're making fun of them. Maybe they don't know, and some of them, they come. They'll, I mean, it has happened to me. He gave me salam, asked me a question. He goes to the shoe area, comes back, oh, Imam, I forgot I have a question. And he repeats the same question. And he, he actually smiles that I have a smile, and I'm talking, and this, and that. Oh, and then he realizes, wait, Imam, maybe I'm bothering you. I think I asked you this. This has happened. But we can't be like, hey, man, I'm irritated. Why you keep asking me the same question? We have to see clearly that someone is not fully capable in the mind. You cannot get annoyed with these people, right? Or somebody may say, oh, Imam, don't spend time with that person. Yeah, he's a loner, who knows what he is. He's probably crazy in the head. Uh, nobody likes him, this, that. Well, guess what? If I want to be a good Imam, I should be spending time with that loner, crazy person, whatever it is that you term him as. Right? This is the way of the Prophet ﷺ. We have to give these human beings, these brothers and sisters of ours time. There should be a community service, which is missing in a lot of Muslim communities. Right? In, in the men's section, there should be some brothers. In the women's section, there should be some uh, women that sit with them. Like, this is the problem with Muslim families. Whenever their son and daughter wants to make a profession, or wants to go to college, son, daughter, you can choose any profession in this world as long as it's engineering or medicine. You're not giving your child much choice. We, we need Muslims to go into the mental health field. We need Muslims to major in social work. We need Muslims to go and, and learn the skills that are needed to deal with those who are physically disabled so that they, they can help the Muslim community. Very few Muslim youth would even think of this because their parents have raised them that way. Why? What is wrong if your daughter wants to go learn how to be a nurse and take care of those who are disabled? Those nurses that sometimes pay their home visits to disabled people. What's the problem? Why, as you, why are you as a Muslim father and mother going to stop your daughter from learning this skill? Or maybe a son wants to go into social work or mental health rehab. And you might be like, oh no, what are you going to do? Deal with crazy people all your life? Why is it that you talk this way as a Muslim? And here is Rasulullah giving his time to a woman who was not fully there. And he's patiently stood there and listened to her talk for a long time, until she was fully satisfied. This is from the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. This is putting your aqidah into practice. If you say you are a muwahid, you are a person of tawheed, it should show in your character, it should show in your actions. That you truly understand worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Allah has put this person in my community, has put these few people in our community, and Allah has blessed me with some proper mental functioning and bodily functioning, I need to do something for them too. SubhanAllah, I have lost count of how many masajid I've visited in America for khut khutab and lectures. They don't even have a ramp for people who want a wheelchair to visit the masjid. And inshallah ta'ala, when you guys have your project in EHT, this is something that you have to keep in mind. You have to build ramps for the disabled people to visit the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have to facilitate the means for those who are disabled to visit Allah's house. They have every right to worship Allah. They have every right to come for the salah, to come for the durus, just as you do. They need to learn their religion, but you need to make it friendly for them. If somebody is coming, sure, maybe I stand on the minbar. I know these two brothers. They're probably in their 20s, but they're autistic. I know they are. Sometimes in the khutbah, I'm giving the khutbah. Well, they're not coming because of the COVID right now, but they used to come. I'd see them sitting on the chair. I can see them laughing because he's not fully there. And, and the people next to them are growling. 
You guys, your brain works 100% and you start talking in the middle of the khutbah. Leave this brother alone. What's wrong with you? Those who understand everything, they can't stop talking in the khutbah. But then they get angry with the one by the qadr of Allah who is not fully there. Leave him alone. Let him be. The Prophet ﷺ did not throw these type of brothers and sisters away from the masjid. Let them listen to the deen of Allah as much as that they are able to understand. They're not going to understand everything. Allah doesn't expect them to. But we need to facilitate the means for them. Once, let's give another hadith. We may, I'm almost, I think it's been 50 minutes, 47 minutes. So another 10, 15 minutes inshallah. The Prophet ﷺ himself made a mistake. Due to which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed not one, 10 ayat in the Quran. Subhanallah. On one, uh, on one occasion, the Prophet ﷺ was addressing one of the elites of Quraysh, one of the big shots of Quraysh. Then Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum, who was one of the uh, uh, mu'addins of the Prophet ﷺ. There was Bilal and also Abdullah ibn Maktoum, ibn Umm Maktoum radiallahu uh, anhuma. He was blind. And Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum was already Muslim when this incident happened. The Prophet ﷺ was really concerned. He wanted to give his whole attention to this noble elite guy of Quraysh. And a lot of us make this mistake. This is the big shot, the guy with the money, the sister with the really well-known this. Let's put our attention towards him or her. Let's take care of them. Maybe they'll warm up and donate more to the masjid and be this or that. Many people do this. So the Prophet ﷺ, he's trying to give him his full attention. He wants with the hope that maybe this person, this noble man of Quraysh will take the shahada, become Muslim. Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum comes, he interrupts the conversation, and he had his own questions. The Prophet ﷺ got irritated, and clearly the frown showed on his face. He frowned at Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum, but he's blind, he doesn't know what the facial expression of the Prophet ﷺ was. So the Prophet ﷺ, the point is, he got upset. He was irritated that I'm trying to convince this noble man of Quraysh to accept Islam and you came and just disrupt, disrupt, uh, disrupted this conversation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala corrected Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa for this mistake. Allah says, Abasa wa tawalla. The Prophet frowned and turned away. Anja'ahu al-a'ma. Because there came to him a blind man. Who was the blind man? Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum radiallahu anhu. وَمَا يُدْرِيكَ لَعَلَّهُ يَزَّكَّ But what would make you perceive, O Muhammad, that perhaps he might be purified? أَوْ يَذَّكَّرُ فَتَنْفَعْهُ الذِّكْرَ Or be reminded and the remembrance would benefit him. What makes you think that that noble man, he's going to be guided, he's going to be benefiting from your words? What makes you think that you should choose him over this weak blind person? أَمَّا مَنِ اسْتَغْنَى As for him who thinks him self-sufficient, فَأَنْتَ لَهُ تَصَدَّى That the, this pagan, he thinks he's self-sufficient. He doesn't need Allah, that's why he doesn't worship Allah, that's why he doesn't believe Allah. He's arrogant, he thinks he's self-sufficient. And to him you're giving attention? وَمَا عَلَيْكَ أَلَّا يَزَّكَّى And not upon you is the blame if he will not be purified. You're not going to be blamed if somebody is not guided to Islam. The guidance is in the hands of Allah. وَأَمَّا مَنْ جَاءَكَ يَسْعَى But as to him who came to you running, وَهُوَ يَخْشَى And he has the khushu', he has the true fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, فَأَنْتَ عَنْهُ تَلَهَّى From him you are distracted. So Allah sends these 10 verses in the Qur'an regarding Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum. That don't undermine him. You are focused on the elite, important guy in society. What makes you think that he's going to be guided? What makes you think he even cares about my deen? And here is someone who is running to you. He fears me. He loves me. He has questions for you. And you are taking your attention away from him and giving it to the guy who doesn't even care? Because we don't know what's in people's hearts. So Allah teaches us by correcting his own Prophet wasallam that do not undermine those who have the disability. Don't ignore them thinking, oh, let me give attention to the person who's more important in society. 
This is not the way a Muslim is supposed to behave. Imam Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah, in the tafsir of these verses, he said, Allah ordered his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa not to confine himself to warning one particular person. Rather, to treat everyone equally, regardless if they were noblemen, or weak people, or blind, or poor, or rich, masters or slaves, men or women, young or old. Does not matter. Give everyone the equal attention. Because you don't know who is going to be guided at what time, who is more purified or really is purified internally, and someone is just faking it. The Prophet ﷺ, he would facilitate things for them and alleviate their hardship. In another hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari and Muslim, Zayd ibn Thabit radiallahu anhu, when the ver- he was the personal scribe of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. When the ayat were revealed, he would uh, memorize them from Jibril alaihi wasallam, and then he would recite them. And Zayd ibn Thabit would write those verses down. So, as Zayd ibn Thabit on one occasion, and this is a hadith from Bukhari and Muslim, when the ayah from Surah An Nisa, لا يستويل لا يستويل قاعدون من المؤمنين والمجاهدون في سبيل الله بأموالهم وأنفسهم. This is what came down first. Not equal are the believers who sit at home and the mujahidun, who strive in the cause of Allah with their wealth and their lives. They're not the same. Those who are just sitting at home doing nothing and those who are actually striving for Allah's religion with their life, with their wealth, guess what? They're much higher in status. You can't be a lazy Muslim, just care about yourself. No, you have to be involved. You have to do things for the Muslim community. You have to be part of the improvement of the community. Sincerely. So when this ayah came down, Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum, the same blind Sahabi, radiallahu anhu, he approached the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam as this verse came down, and as he was dictating sallallahu alaihi wasallam the ayah to Zayd ibn Thabit, and he said, "I wish I could go fight, but I'm blind, meaning I have this disability, I can't, and, and I wish I want to go fight." I want to do what you guys are doing. I want to be part of it. So then, uh, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, his thighs were very close to the thighs of Zayd ibn Thabit as he's dictating. Zayd ibn Thabit radiallahu anhu, he then felt his thighs were going to be crushed because the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was getting another revelation, and when the revelation is coming. And his thighs were pressing against the thighs of Zayd ibn Thabit. He said, "I felt like my thighs were going to be crushed. My bones inside were going to be crushed from the pressure of the revelation that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was receiving." And at that moment, Allah added in the second revelation a word in between: "غَيْرُ أُلِدْدَرَرْ Other than the disabled. So, what is there now? The verse, the actual completed verse. لا يستوي القاعدون من المؤمنين غير أولي الضرر that those believers who are sitting at home, other than those who are disabled, they are not the same as the mujahidun who strive with their money, with their lives. So here Allah revealed that those who have disabilities, guess what? It's a rahma from Allah. You are physically excused from undertaking these. Really tough physical actions that are done for the sake of Islam. You're excused. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he explained this to these disabled companions. Don't feel bad. It is from Allah. You will get your reward for your genuine intention, but you have no physical responsibility. Then also Allah subhanahu wa taala in another ayah in Surah Fath, He said, "ليس على الأعمى حرج." ولا على الأعرج حرج ولا على المريض حرج. There is no blame. There is no sin upon the one who is blind, upon the one who uh, is lame, constraint, upon the one who is sick. ومن يطع الله ورسوله يدخله جنة جنات تجري من تحتها الأنهار. Whoever obeys Allah and His Messenger, for him, Jannah, gardens under which rivers flow, awaits. وَمَنْ يَتَوَلَّ يُعَذِّبْهُ عَذَابًا أَلِيمًا As for the one who turns away from Allah and His Messenger, regardless of whether he's healthy or disabled, then for him is the punishment. And Allah has stored that punishment, a painful torment. So clearly in the Qur'an, Allah makes it clear. Whether you are blind, you have some other type of 
physical uh, constraint, whether you have other type of illness and sicknesses, you're excused from certain physical duties. Didn't the Prophet ﷺ said that the one who is able, you pray standing. If you have a physical disability which prevents you from standing, you pray sitting. If you have a physical disability that prevents you from even sitting, you pray laying down. But your reward will not even be a one inch, one little bit ounce little than less than the one who is praying standing. In fact, if you have more khushur, you will get more reward than the one who's standing and praying. So as long as you are obeying Allah and His Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you will not be deprived of anything. Jannah, gardens under which rivers flow, is waiting for you. So he facilitated these things. He explained it to the people. That don't feel sad, don't overburden yourself. If you are physically incapable of doing something, Allah has excused you. If the disabled individual wanted to go even for jihad, he is insisting the Prophet ﷺ would not prevent them. Let them feel like they belong. Let them feel that they are doing something for the sake of Islam, for the benefit of the ummah. Some people might think, hey, you know, what exactly are you going to do? You can't really help us. Maybe somebody might be having, he doesn't have arms. And you're painting the masjid. And he says, brothers, I want to come. And if you go to him, well, you don't even have hands. How are you going to help us paint? Let him sit there. Let him make dua for you guys. Let him have a conversation. Let him feel as if he has done something. Let him be part of that painting situation. Let him sit there. What's the problem? He's not going to bother you. So the Prophet ﷺ, as is reported in the hadith in Musnad Ahmed, one of the companions, uh, Amr ibn, ibn al-Jamuh radiallahu anhu, as Abu Qatada radiallahu anhu, he narrates the hadith in Musnad Ahmed. Amr ibn al-Jamuh, he was a man with crippled legs. He simply could not walk properly. His legs were crippled. And he insisted, I want to fight. Just let me go. I want to fight. The Prophet sallallahu saw this devotion, saw this love in him. He said, okay, fine. He's already disabled. He's not going to be able to out... Uh, you know, uh, out fights uh, some pagan from Quraysh or this or that. But still, let him belong. Let him feel like he's doing something for Islam. Let him feel that happiness inside. Let him be part of it. And guess what happened? This was for the Battle of Uhud. He died. He got killed. He died as a shaheed. So when the Prophet ﷺ saw his body, he ﷺ said, it is as if I am looking at him walking in Jannah. Subhanallah. He was a man who's crippled. Right? Of course, wheelchairs probably were not, not probably, were not invented back then. If he was alive in our generation, he'd be on a wheelchair. Let me go, do something. Let me just carry the sword and do something. Let him feel that he's doing something. Let him feel good inside that he's doing something for the sake of Allah. So brothers and sisters, we have to facilitate things for our disabled brothers and sisters. Don't just... Ah, you can't do it. You're physically incapable. Just let them just sit with you. Let them give the ideas. What's stopping? Maybe he knows something. He watched a video somewhere. He read something. He can offer a great idea. Use his idea. Let him sit with you. And he'll also feel happy. Yeah, I did something for the community. This is the way we have to be. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and I'll end with uh, two more evidences from the Quran and the Sunnah. Allah himself, this is now, let's go to an ayah. Allah Himself subhanahu wa ta'ala urged the believers to socialize with those who have disability. It's an ayah in the Quran. Socialize with those who are disabled in order to soothe their hearts. So if people avoid the disabled individuals and do not interact with them by eating and drinking and sitting with them, and we already mentioned the hadith uh, of Mahmud ibn Rabi' uh, from Bukhari and Muslim radiallahu anhu, where the Prophet ﷺ went to the disabled person's house, uh, sat with him, ate with him, prayed in his house. So Allah said in the Quran, in Surah An-Nur, "Laysa ala al-a'ma haraj, wala ala al-a'raj haraj, wala ala al-marid haraj, wala ala anfusikum." There is no restriction on the blind, nor any restriction on those who are lame, constraint, nor any restriction on those who are sick, nor on yourselves. No restriction on anyone, whether disabled or healthy. And ta'kulu min buyutikum. 
that if you were to eat in your homes, أو بيوت آبائكم أو بيوت أمهاتكم أو بيوت إخوانكم أو بيوت أخواتكم Whether you eat by yourselves in your house or you eat in the houses of your fathers or the houses of your mothers or the houses of your brothers or the houses of your sisters أو بيوت عمامكم أو بيوت عماتكم أو بيوت أخوالكم أو بيوت خالاتكم Or you go eat in the houses of your father's brothers your paternal uncles or the houses of your paternal aunts, or the houses of your maternal uncles, or the houses of your maternal aunts. أو ما ملكتم مفاتحه أو صديقكم Or the houses to whom you have keys. Somebody trusts you, gave you the key to their house. You have their key, you can go to their house, eat with them. Or you can have make friends, eat with them as well in their homes. ليس عليكم جناح أن تأكلوا جميعا أو أشتاتا. There is no sin on you, whether you go socialize and eat together. These and Allah breaks it down who you wanna eat with, whether you're healthy or disabled, or you wanna eat by yourself separately. You have the choice. فإذا دخلتم بيوتا فسلموا على أنفسكم تحية من عند الله مباركة طيبة. But when you enter the homes, if you choose to go socialize and eat with other people in their houses, then you should greet one another. The moment you enter the house of that person, give salam. This is the way a Muslim greets another Muslim. This is the greeting from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is blessed, and this is the good greeting. Don't say hi, hello, bye, how are you, you know, stuff like this. Say assalamu alaikum. This is the best greeting. This is the blessed greeting. This is the greeting from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. كَذَلِكَ يُبَيِّنُ اللَّهُ لَكُمُ الْآيَاتِ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَعْقِلُونَ This is the way Allah makes clear His signs so that you may understand. In Tafsir al-Tabari, it is mentioned here, the people of Medina, before the nubuwa of the Prophet ﷺ, before the Prophet ﷺ came there, they used to never mix with those who were disabled. Whether somebody had physical disability, blind, deaf, whatever may be the case. They never used to eat with the blind and the sick. Some would say, this is disgusting, they're dirty. Others would say, oh, we're going to also become blind. You know, superstitious beliefs, they're all mushrikun. Somebody's crippled, oh, if you sit with him, you're probably going to become crippled too. Many people have these superstitious beliefs, subhanAllah, like foolish beliefs. They would not sit and eat with them. And Allah sends this verse, breaking it down. As the Mufassirun said, and Allah even says, لَيْسَ عَلَيْكُمْ جُنَاحٌ There's no blame on you, no sin on you. This is an encouragement from Allah. In your pagan culture, you would think that this is disease, just because somebody is disabled. Well, there is no sin, there is no harm, no haraj whatsoever. Whether somebody be blind, somebody has physical deformity, somebody is sick, go to their homes, sit with them, eat with them. So Allah is encouraging social interaction with those who are disabled. Subhanallah. How many of us remember this? Right? Somebody uh, might come, have a party in their house, they'll tell their disabled relative or this or that, no, 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 don't come. He doesn't know how to talk, he'll do this, he'll do that, I'll, he'll embarrass me. Subhanallah. You're, you're worried about this and not about the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? It's an embarrassment that you do not understand the rahmah that Allah, the, the blessings that Allah has given you. That this is the way you re react. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. One more, one other thing, inshallah. Uh, we see that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he would give these disabled sahabi, sahaba, if they were capable, if they had the merit, they were, they had the ability. Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum, as I mentioned, he was one of the muaddins of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. As the hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari goes, when it came to Ramadan, he said, don't, eat, don't stop eating your sahur when Bilal gives the adhan, because that's the first adhan of Fajr. Stop eating when Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum gives the adhan. So uh, the Prophet ﷺ put this blind person, gave him the responsibility of calling the adhan. He was also an imam for his people, for his tribe. He had the ability, he memorized, he understood, he had the ilm. So Allah, the, Allah's Prophet ﷺ made him the imam for his people. So we see here, just because somebody is disabled, and that's what I mentioned in the beginning, 
we had so many ulama in our history who were blind. One of the biggest scholars of today, uh, hadith scholars, Shaykh Abdul Muhsin al Abbad, Hafidahullah, one of my favorite shuyukh alive. But when I say the word favorite, doesn't mean I'm blind for him because. I mean, we always have to have disclaimers nowadays because people are, have become ridiculous. They think just by liking somebody, you become blind, you worship that person, which is completely <laughs> against our religion, right? So he's one of the muhaddithun that are still alive, 90 years old or so, eight, late 80, 90 years old. He's on his wheelchair. He's, you know, can't walk. People have to push him. He's giving his durus in Masjid al-Nabawi after Salat al-Maghrib. He's explaining Sahih al-Bukhari, he's explaining Sahih Muslim, he's the Hadith scholar of Medina. What, is somebody gonna say, hey, you're on a wheelchair, you're disabled, you shouldn't be teaching? This is not the way. He's capable, he has the ilm, he has the right. That's his honor that Allah gives him. Right, so it doesn't matter if somebody's disabled, it doesn't matter if somebody is crippled. The Prophet ﷺ even gave the disabled Sahaba ranks positions, the ability to teach, to abil the ability to become leaders, because they had the capacity to do so. That's how we have to be. We have to find, you may think that there's a woman in the community who uh, you know, is on a wheelchair, and you may think, no, we don't want to make her in charge of anything. She could be a better planner than all the women who are able to walk and run. She's a better organizer. Take her, make use of her talent. Use her for the Muslim community. Let her earn reward. Let her participate. The same thing on the men's side. We have to be an inclusive community. The Prophet ﷺ was inclusive. He did not care who's disabled, who's healthy. Are you capable of undertaking this responsibility in the best, most sincere way, whatever the responsibility was, based on their physical means, of course. And he gave it to them. So that is the way we have to be and one last point uh, that I want to end with, inshallah ta'ala. The Prophet ﷺ, he was even merciful to the hypocrites who were disabled. And this is a narration that's been brought by uh, Imam ibn al-Qayyim in Zad al-Ma'ad, also by Imam ibn Kathir in uh, the seerah that he has, uh, uh, Imam ibn Kathir's seerah that he has. There was one of the hypocrites uh, by the name of Mirba. He was blind. So the Prophet ﷺ was traveling with some of the companions. I mean, I mean, look at this. He's blind, he's a munafiq, he's from the munafiqun. He heard the Prophet ﷺ walking in front of his property. He heard the voice, he heard the voices of the companions. He can't see, right? He picked up the dirt and he said, of course he's gonna throw the dirt without seeing where it's going. And he says, by Allah, if I knew that I will not be able to hit anything when I throw this dirt except for you, Ya Muhammad, I will throw it. Subhanallah, I mean, look at how much hatred this blind man had for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and Islam. We will also meet bigots in this day and age who are on the internet, maybe he's on a wheelchair, she's on a wheelchair, cursing away Islam, being a troll for Muslim websites and pages and cursing Islam and this and that. The person could be disabled, we don't know. So here is this blind hypocrite. He's even saying something like this, subhanAllah, like, so, the pro so then the, one of the companions said, hey, let's execute him for what he just said to the Prophet wasallam. And he wasallam, said, leave him. This man is blind in his heart and he is blind from his sight. Leave him. Because Allah did not send him and did not send the Muslims to go attack those who are physically disabled. Even the enemy of Rasulullah who was disabled, he did not do anything to him because he's crippled. All he said is, well, Allah deprived him of eyesight and his heart is also blind. Just leave him. Let Allah take care of such a person. So that is Islam, my dear brothers and sisters. That even a kafir who hates Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is cursing the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam on his face. No one was allowed to even lay a finger on him because of the fact that he's disabled. Have some type of rahmah for them. 
So what do you think, brothers and sisters, about your Muslim brother or sister who is disabled? How much care should we have for them? This one hadith should explain it to you. That he had rahmah for a hypocrite kafir who was cursing at him on his face. Don't touch him, let him be. He's blind in the heart and he's blind in his eyes. Leave him to Allah. So that statement from the Prophet ﷺ shows us that he is leaving him because of the fact that he's disabled. He reminds his companions. He is blind in his heart just like he is blind in his eyes. Leave him to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we should not do this. Uh, even if somebody's a kafir, don't go around here, oh, this guy's Christian Jew, uh, who cares what's happening? Somebody's disabled. Help them out, make a way. They see you dressed as a Muslim, looking like a Muslim, inshallah ta'ala. You never know. And you can tell them, my Prophet, even with those who used to hate him, the disabled people who used to hate him, he was kind with them and showed them mercy. This becomes an avenue for da'wah. So inshallah ta'ala, we will end here. I see uh, quite a few questions, inshallah. Let's uh, get to them. But hopefully, brothers and sisters, those of you who are present and those of you who will watch this later on, the point here, what I want you to take from this lecture, that please change your perspective if you had been raised in a certain way, culturally speaking, or whatever may be the case. This is the way you are supposed to think about those who are disabled. This is the way you're supposed to treat those who are disabled from the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So one sister is asking, <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, please remember we all have more abilities than disabilities. If searched deeply, we all are, have been given assets. Of course, mashallah, uh, may Allah bless you sister. Those are some wise words. Of course, we always have to think of uh, the blessings that Allah has uh, given. Uh, let's see. If someone has been afflicted by the virus, is that a disability? And should we be visiting them or welcoming them into the masjid? No, that is of course a sickness. Uh, that uh, is a different ruling. The Prophet ﷺ made it very clear that the one who is sick, do not bring them to those who are healthy. This is the hadith in Sahih Muslim. Uh, don't bring the healthy and the sick together, mix them. So when somebody is sick like this with the flu or the coronavirus, something that is contagious. Of course, remember I gave a khutbah a few weeks back. The disease in and of itself does not have the power to transfer from body to body. It is Allah who tests people with it. Right? We have to remember that. That's an issue of aqidah and tawheed. But the Prophet ﷺ said, you take your precautions. You depend on Allah and you take your precautions. You can't physically visit this person who has the flu or the virus, subhanAllah. And uh, by the way, uh, I must mention, there's a, a few of our regular brothers in our community the past few days, they have been uh, tested positive with the virus, and some of them are actually in the hospital as I speak right now. So please keep them in your du'as, the, our community members, and Muslims everywhere. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward them and heal them, and get rid of this virus uh, from, uh, from us. So, but anyways, uh, going back, so any uh, person who has a disease that can be contagious, you call them, text them. You have other modes of communication, alhamdulillah, in this day and age. Don't just let them be when you hear it. Give them a call, check up on them. They'll feel good, right? La ba'as, tahuran, insha'Allah. Don't worry, this is a purification for you, insha'Allah. These are the du'as from the sunnah. So do that, insha'Allah ta'ala, but do not mix with those who are suffering from contagious diseases. That's an illness, not a disability. If someone's clothes are impure and the waqt of salah will be gone before they... Impure, sorry. If someone's clothes are impure and the waqt of salah will be gone before they can be changed, is one allowed to pray? Now, if there is some type of najas, impurity, actual impurity, urine, feces, you know, some examples. There's actual impurity. Uh, you have to change your clothes or wash them with the soap and everything. Uh, you are allowed to join Dhuhr and Asr, Maghrib and Isha. So fix, because it, that is a condition. You cannot come to Salah with impurity. If, Allah forbid, you are stuck in a situation where you do not have water available, then you do tayammam. That's a different, that's a, that's 
a specific rule, not the general rule, right? Based on need. So Allah forbid you are in a situation where there is no water available for you to clean the impurity out of your clothes, then you make tayammum and you pray. However, water is available to you, you must wash off the impurity. Uh, how can Muslims come together uh, to better serve the Muslims with disabilities such as mental illnesses and the likes? Uh, our brother Hanif from... Uh, uh, you're you're going to hate me. I completely forgot. North Carolina or South Carolina? <laughs> I apologize, Akhi. But one of the Carolinas. <laughs> so our brother Hanif asks a good question. Uh, so um, this is, of course, something that is very important uh, that sadly many of the Muslim communities are failing in. However, I did notice some communities, mashallah, tabarakallah, are making big strides in what they are doing for their people. All right, North Carolina. Okay, alhamdulillah. Uh, for their people for their community. And that is something that all Muslim communities can actually learn from and start uh, imitating. The, these things you're supposed to imitate. You know how we love to say, oh, that guy is doing it, why don't I do it? These good things that are a revival of the sunnah, those are the things you're supposed to imitate. Don't imitate the bad and the bid'ah and the other thing that the peop a lot of people do. When you see people are, a group of people are doing something that's good, that's established in the religion, they are reviving a sunnah of the Messenger Wasallam imitate them, learn from them, reach out to them, see what they're doing. And especially mental health situations, there are mental health of all kinds. And this is something that, I, Allah knows my intention, This is I'm not saying this in a way of boasting, but I'm just saying because of experience. Alhamdulillah, I've had years of experience dealing with brothers and sisters suffering from bipolarism, uh, schizophrenia, OCD, and other mental illnesses. Many of those diseases are directly as a result of jinn possession and sihr and things like that. So it's a different field for which I was involved in it, helping them, counseling them, teaching them how to do the ruqya and things like that. But it, I mean, I have to be honest with you, it will take a toll. But we have to do it. I didn't have a problem doing it. If I had the time, I would still be doing it. But I just don't have the time. But these are things that you have to do. Just because somebody has mental illness, split personality, schizophrenia, I mean, these can be really severe. And you have to treat them with the Qur'an. We have to teach our Muslim community how to treat these type of mental illnesses that are a direct result of things like sihr or uh, mas and things like that. And there are other mental illnesses, people go through depression, people go through other psychological problems, childhood trauma, there have been cases uh, again, which alhamdulillah still I do even with the brothers and sisters here. Somebody may have been molested as a child, but they never got the Islamic counseling that is needed. And now they're older in their 20s and their 30s. And they, people would think that they act crazy, but there's a deeper psychological problem with them. We have to counsel them. The Prophet Islam, as we saw from the woman who had something wrong with her uh, mind, he was counseling her. He was listening to her complaints. He was listening to her problems. And then he gave her advice. He calmed her down. This is the definition of counseling. So a Muslim community, we have to have counselors, right? A lot of times, of course, if some imams, some du'at, they have the personal experience, they went and learned, that's good. MashaAllah, tabarakAllah, we can utilize them. But not every imam, not every da'i has that experience. And a lot of communities, they want their imam to be superhuman. That is a completely wrong way to approach your imams and shuyukh. You can't expect one imam to do 100% of the things that are needed. Didn't the Prophet ﷺ assign other companions, even though he's the messenger of Allah? He taught and he assigned groups of people to take care of certain things. It's impossible for one person to take care of everything. That's why I mentioned in the lecture, we need young Muslims to go learn mental health, uh, uh, how to take care of those who are suffering uh, with mental illnesses, uh, you know, other drug ad addiction, uh, these type of things. You, there are Muslim, even in our own community, we have men and women who are drug addicts. We need qualified Muslims who know how to deal with drug addicts. 
we don't want to send them to the rehabs of the kuffar. Because at the end of the day, brothers and sisters, we have to remember something. Sure, we have to help their minds, we have to help their bodies. Who is going to help their iman except for a Muslim? When you send this disabled Muslim to the kuffar, are they ever going to hear the Qur'an? Are they ever going to hear a hadith? Are they ever going to learn about Allah and His Messenger or Yawm Al-Qiyamah? Those who have the mental capacity to understand. Someone who is completely out of it, we know the pen is lifted from those people. That's from our religion. But I'm talking about people who come and go, or people who are fully there but physically disabled. Their iman has to be given attention. Who is going to do that except for Muslim caretakers? So it is very important for Muslim communities to inshallah come together, find social workers within the Muslim community, people who are, uh, you know, brothers and sisters who may be nurses, working at hospitals, working at clinics, dealing with disabled people. They should give some of their time to the Muslim community. This is how it works. All of us have to be involved, right? If a doctor is working five days a week, he will get the thawab from Allah. He has to have it in his heart. You know what? I want to dedicate few hours a week during my days off. I want to come, offer medical advice to the Muslim community members who don't have health insurance. Right? What is your problem? Let me help you. That's a Muslim doctor. Right? These are, these are the things we need. And there are many communities. Like, let's not go too far. Even in Philadelphia, mashallah, alhamdulillah, they have free clinics now. A group of Muslim doctors came together. They alternate the days of who's going to be there. In Cherry Hill, they have a, a free clinic run by Muslim doctors uh, for Muslims who don't have health care. And they left it open even for the non-Muslims, right? So this is a great dawah avenue as well. So these are the things, brothers and sisters, that Muslim communities we should be uh, working on. And I, I got to be honest, there's a lot of people in America, they think us, us Salafis, people who are calling to Tawheed and the Sunnah, we don't care about these things, right? It, it, some of us have made a bad name. We're talking about Tawheed and Sunnah, which we have to, we have no choice. We have, that's the core foundation of our religion. But these things, these lectures are also part of Tawheed. How are you going to be a proper, genuine believer if you do not know or learn how to take care of those who are weak and oppressed within the community? A hadith I, I just remembered from Abu Darda radiallahu anhu. It's a hadith in Abu Dawood. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa commanded Abu Darda and by him uh, the other companions and all of us. Ibghunid uh, du'afa. Seek out those who are weak among you. Seek the weak Muslims among you. Why? The innama turzaquna wa tunsaruna you will indeed receive risk, provision, and you will receive victory by the weak among you. Subhanallah. That's a command from the Prophet ﷺ, that go to your community, seek the weak ones. So let's put it in context. Let's say our community here. We should make an effort to seek those who are autistic. Seek those who are suffering from these mental illnesses like schizophrenia, OCD, bipolar, uh, split personalities, whatever may be the case. Uh, other disabilities, physical disabilities, uh, and things like that. Seek them out. Help them. By helping them, Allah will increase your risk, and Allah will give you victory. People think that victory for the ummah will come with the weapons and the money and this and that. Look at Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. Didn't he fight in the battles with his crippled legs? With his short stature, Allah gave him victory. Allah gave these blind people victory. Allah gave these disabled people victory. So we have to remember this. Seek out the weak, seek out the oppressed, seek out those who are less privileged than you. Help them and Allah will increase your risk and Allah will give you victory. So this is very important. Us as Muslim community, as a Muslim community, we have to get together and, and facilitate these things more and more, inshallah ta'ala. Let's see, uh, maybe I'll take one more question. Uh, I see a few brothers, Jazakallahu khair, a few brothers are asking about my mother's situation. Uh, yeah, inshallah ta'ala, I mean, she is doing what she is supposed to be doing in her condition. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know, 
My mother actually has been disabled for the past 20 years. Uh, so me and my sister are pretty much accustomed to it. There are times when she needs help to go to even the bathroom, she cannot walk and things like that. But every now and then her condition gets very serious. Uh, every few months or so she has to go back to the hospital. So this is something that I, I grew up with. I mean, 20 years of my life I've been seeing my mother this way. Um, and I would like to actually, as an encouragement, Wallahi brothers and sisters, and of course Allah is my witness, this is not what I was always dreaming of doing. When I was a teenager, I wanted to be a professional athlete. I, I think I said this before, like I, wa I was crazy. You want me to place 10, 12 hours a day, I'll play, right? And my dad used to make fun. My son's not gonna stop throwing the ball or hitting the bat until something breaks. Like, he's like an energizer battery. He'll keep going and going. So from then, of course, when I got into college, uh, you know, went into the regular education that everybody does, but I was majoring in business administration because I, I liked economics and things like that. But then when my mom had her surgery and everything like that, and I was learning my religion, uh, alhamdulillah, by that time already, salah, this, that, attending lectures and this and that. It, it, that was actually one of the turning points, one of the two turning points in my life. And I actually made dua to Allah as I was taking my mother to the bathroom, helping her wash herself and this and that, because my sister was much younger 20 years ago, right? She wasn't capable. And my dad has work. It was during that time while taking care of her, me and my mother would make that dua, that I asked my mom, that if you're happy with what I'm doing, I really want to be a da'i. If Allah accepts this, and I used to make tawassul, I have no shame in saying this, Allah is my witness. I would make tawassul with that, that, oh Allah, if I'm doing this sincerely, open the doors for me to study your religion and teach it. Wallahi, wallahi, I have no doubt that Allah accepted that action from me and gave me this ability. This is something that I, I will tell everybody as long as I live and my children too. Take care of the disabled people. Allah will answer your du'as inshallah ta'ala. The good thing, I've seen it in my own life. And I'm not a person who's a muttaqi. I'm an average Muslim struggling. I have sins, I have shortcomings, I have mistakes. I'm struggling just like any one of you. So if it can work for me, inshallah it will work for you as well. Patiently take care of those who are disabled, especially your relatives. That is one of the best things you can do. So I just wanted to share that, uh, inshallah ta'ala, about myself uh, to encourage my community members and others. So inshallah ta'ala, we'll stop here. Uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to heal our sick, to make us among those Muslims who uh, take care of those who are weak, those who are disabled. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give patience to those who are disabled and give them the reward and give us the ability and the reward to take care of them. Aqulu qawli hadha astaghfirullah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.